Morning and thank you again for joining us as we continue to look at the life of Joseph. But before we do that, uh, just to briefly mention that both Deirdre Pinio and uh, Keith Childs are back home recovering after their operations and thank you for all your prayers and concern uh, for them. So we carry on with our uh, series on Joseph and the amazing sovereignty of God um, in his life. We're looking today at chapters 39 and 40, which are about good times, bad times, uh, and God. Because how we deal with both the good times and the bad times that we go through is one of the big challenges uh, to our faith. Uh, it's all very well to remember that God is good during the good times, but we also have to keep on believing that when times are uh, more difficult and unpredictable. Now, we started with Joseph last week, and we started looking at his life and his family. Uh, in Genesis chapter 37, we saw uh, that Joseph's family was deeply dysfunctional. There was favoritism, there were jealousies, there was hatred. And in a funny way, we can take comfort in that, because we all relate to that. We all know that within our families there are difficulties and there are tensions, especially in our wider uh, families. Uh, and that was true of Joseph as well, and yet God was able to work through all of the bad things that happened in his family. But things ended up with Joseph being carried off into slavery to the household of Potiphar in Egypt, and it was indeed a very bad time for Joseph. So that's our first point uh, this morning. As we come to chapter 39, the first point this morning is that the Lord was with Joseph in good times. And let me read verses 1 to 6 of Genesis 39. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites, the Midianites, who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in the eyes and became his attendant. And Potiphar put him in charge of his household and entrusted to his care everything he owned. Now, he has an amazing turnaround, if ever there was one. In New Testament terms, this looks a lot like Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, where Paul says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. The fact that Joseph uh, was hated by his brothers, sold into slavery, has led him uh, to end up in the household of Potiphar, who's a very wealthy soldier in Egypt. And this leads him uh, to the economic and military uh, center of the world as it was there in Egypt. And there Joseph thrives and Potiphar promotes him to the point where he becomes Potiphar's right-hand man in charge of everything with status and with um, authority. And on top of that, we are told that Joseph is looking well in verse 6, that he's handsome in appearance. And so he became, Joseph became a successful man with the favor and support of what today I suppose we would call the secular authorities, the ruling authorities. Why did this happen? Well, it's because, as the Bible emphasizes, the Lord was with him. Uh, we've seen how in verse 3, his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. When things go well for God's people and things are good, why is that? Well, it's because God is with his people and God blesses them and God gives them success. We see that on a national level. There are times in a country when God's people, when the church has thrived, as Joseph did, with growth in numbers, with growth in influence, uh, with a certain degree of security and influence for the good of the nation. And that happens when God is with his people. It's true on an individual level as well. I remember when once when my father, my, my father said to me when he was in his, I don't know, middle, late 50s, and he said that he'd lived a good life. I think he might have used the words, I've lived a charmed life. And by that he meant um, 
He'd had a happy marriage with three children. He'd run a fairly successful small business in Port Elizabeth. He had a wide circle of friends. He'd received some recognition from a professional point of view. He, he, he had a house that was paid off and he was thankful for what he had and he was right to be. And he had a taste, you could say, of what Joseph experienced, that the Lord was with Joseph in good times. But of course, life isn't always straightforward. And there's a twist again in the story. And we see secondly now how the Lord was with Joseph in bad times. Because anyone who's seen Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat knows the good times didn't last. And just when everything seemed to be going well, Joseph found himself assailed by a strong temptation, unjustly attacked, persecuted, falsely imprisoned. It all started when he was assailed by temptation as Potiphar's very uh, immoral wife took a fancy to him. And this is what happened as we read from verse 6 of Genesis chapter uh, 39. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had, that is Potiphar, with Joseph in charge. He did not, not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in the house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against him? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. It's interesting for us to notice Joseph's strategy here for not falling into temptation. The first thing is know what's right ahead of the time before the temptation comes. The second, which he did and we must do, is to keep God in view. It's very Striking that what he says to Potiphar's wife is, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? In the heat of the moment, he doesn't only acknowledge, which he does, that his master Potiphar has been very good to him, but he acknowledges ultimately that all sin is sin against God. And thirdly, in the light of that, well, like Joseph, we mustn't listen to the temptation. That's what verse 10 says. Although she came at him day after day after day, he would not uh, listen to her. The onslaught was relentless, but because of his faith in God, Joseph was having none of it. In the end, he paid a high price for his faith and for his integrity. He angered her by not giving in. Eventually, she unjustly accuses him. And more than that, she deliberately seeks to destroy him. She knew exactly what she was doing. She lied. She lied again. And she still lied some more on top of that. And eventually she got what she wanted. And Potiphar believed her. A wiser man would surely have had more insight into which of the two were more trustworthy. But he didn't. What we have here is an ancient example of the modern day sad phenomenon of cancel culture. Which is rife in our society today. Today on Facebook, on social media, you can accuse anybody of anything without any witnesses, without any due process in court or otherwise, you can accuse them and they are seen to be guilty uh, and often in many cases it's, it's unfair and it's unjust and it's not true. That's the cancel culture of our society and here's an early form of it and we shouldn't be surprised that it's all around us today. The net result of it all is that Joseph is thrown into prison Joseph's master took him, put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there um, in prison. Now, of course, Joseph was tempted, as we sometimes are when we go through bad times, to feel as if God is not there anymore. But that is never the case, and it was not the case with Joseph. And so in Genesis chapter 39 and verse 21, it says this, But the Lord was with Joseph. And showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And so Joseph ends up running the prison. Just as he'd been put in charge of Potiphar's household before. Why? Well again, verse 23. Because the Lord was with Joseph and whatever he did, the Lord made it to um, succeed. 
The Bible is saying here that God showed towards Joseph steadfast love. That is unwavering love and faithfulness to his promise. Even when everything seemed to be falling apart, God was there with Joseph. He was carrying Joseph through it. He was working out his purposes. Even through the evil that was done to Joseph, God is carrying out his purposes for him. And that's why we talk about the amazing sovereignty of God. We can look ahead and see that God was using these events to shape Joseph not to get into a not only to get into a soldier's household, but to get right to the very top, to get right to the notice of Pharaoh and into the royal household. And in fact, that's what Genesis chapter 40 sets up with the account of Joseph in prison and the two dreams of the king's cup bearer and the baker who are in prison with him and Joseph's God-given interpretation of those uh, uh, dreams. Um, chapter 40 ends with Joseph still being forgotten and languishing in prison. But the scene is set for God's next big move in Joseph's life. But that's for the future and that's for next week. And I hope you'll tune in to hear what happens. But here's the point. The Lord is there. It takes faith to know it. Uh, the kind of faith that the Apostle Paul shows when he writes about joy in his letter to the Philippians and he says in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12 and verse 18 I want you to know brothers that this has happened in other words he's in prison it's happened because it has really served to advance the gospel and he goes on and he says yes I will rejoice I mentioned earlier just about my father's apparent uh, good life charmed life well around about the age of 60 uh, the good times turned into some bad times. My sister, who was just 30, died of cancer. She'd struggled with cancer for three years. He was one of those who lost money on the master bond fraud scheme. And then in his late 60s, he developed brain cancer and he was bedridden for the best part of 18 months. And so the good times, well, they don't always last. So point one, the Lord was with Joseph in the good times. Point two, the Lord was with Joseph in the bad times. And finally, here I think is the application for all of us. The Lord is with us, both in good times and in bad times. It's very easy to lose sight of God in both the good times and the bad, although, albeit for different reasons, in the good times it's easy to become complacent, to forget about God. In the bad times, it's easy to become bitter and to turn away from God. So what's the answer? How can we hold fast to the certain knowledge that the Lord is with us, both in good times and bad times? Let me leave you with three things that Joseph did and that we should do too. Number one, trust God no matter what, because God is both powerful and loving. Trust Him. Number two, obey God no matter what. Build habits of godly integrity when the going is easier and so then follow Joseph's example when the crunch comes and number three watch and wait and see what God will do a bit of of it we'll see during our earthly lives most of it of course we'll have to wait until heaven one day Joseph had no idea of what lay in store for him what God was preparing for him but nevertheless he trusted God and we must trust God both in the good times and in the bad times as we trust him as we obey him as we watch and as we wait and so let's pray together Heavenly Father we know that we can't do these things on our own so please help us Help us to know that you are with us in good times and in bad. Deepen our faith in the Lord Jesus. And by your Holy Spirit, give us grace to trust you, to obey you, and to watch and to wait, no matter what. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.